the power of listening versus hearing is not just asking one question, ideally what I call TED-based questions that I got taught in my career, but asking a second, third, fourth level question, truly to get to understanding more about the pain problem, the issue that might be at hand. Um, I found that if you just ask a question and start talking about yourself, you, you're the opposite of authenticity. You're doing what every, I would say, non-elite seller does. They just, they come in, you know, can't wait to talk about all the product, the things they got going on in their life, but the client could give, they might give, pardon my French, two shits about it. This is Outside Sales Talk, the best podcast for outside salespeople. I'm your host, Steve Benson, and we're here to chat with the world's top sales experts so that you can get their best sales tactics to level up your game. Welcome back to Outside Sales Talk. I've got Casey Jaycox with me here today, and we're going to talk about why authentic relationships are the secret to sales success. Casey, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Uh, so by way of introduction, Casey is a sales development coach, and he's also a keynote speaker, and he helps companies build relationships um, and not just transactional deals. He's the host of the Quarterback Dadcast, which is a podcast that offers stories, advice, and wisdom for fathers looking to improve their leadership skills and emotional intelligence. Casey's also the author of the book, Win the Relationship, Not the Deal. So really excited to get your, uh, your take on a bunch of stuff here today, Casey. Um, first question, uh, we're living in an era where society appreciates being vulnerable and being honest. How would you say this is relevant for sales success? Yeah, I, two of my favorite words, the vulnerability and authenticity. Um, I think vulnerability is, you know, you've heard people talk about, you know, Brene Brown, obviously her work, but people talk about vulnerability, vulnerability meaning that like it's weakness. You don't want to show weakness, but I think it's the exact opposite. When you're not afraid to tell a customer, hey, I'm not sure, let me get back to you. Or, you know, I'm not sure what, what that means. Tell me more about that. And use an open-ended framework that I got taught called TED-based questions, which is tell me, explain, describe. Or, and, and being you know, yet authentic self, one of my dad jokes I always say is the number one reason to be yourself is because everybody else is already taken. And, you know, I think when we can truly be ourselves because A, we believe what we do matters, but, you know, two, we just it's so much easier to be one person than trying to figure out, okay, who am I today? And who was I yesterday? And, and what story did I say? Just, I just say, just be yourself. And when you let your authentic self shine, which is one of the chapters in my book I wrote about is you just allow people to kind of see you for who you are. And, and I think relationships tend to develop quickly when those two skill sets are prevalent. Absolutely. And, and, and how would you say that relates to sales success? Well, I think, I think in, in sales, when you're authentic yourself, uh, I think people will like, you know, you've heard the people talk about know, like, and trust. Well, when you're, when customers know you're truly in it for them, you're authentically in it for them. Um, or, you, you know, I, I've, I found through my sales journey that I was a lot more successful than people that were fake. Uh, people that tried to pretend they knew everything about everything. Um, even internally speaking, when you can be authentic to yourself and, and not afraid to say, I don't know, and maybe ask your leader for help, your teammate for help. Um, I think that authentic journey I went on allowed me to achieve elite level selling results um, in the staffing and consulting space. And, uh, and we all make first impressions in these situations, right? And since setting expectations is so important uh, in business, how can salespeople manage their first impressions so that it's a win-win for everybody and uh, kind of leveraging these concepts? Yeah, I, I, you're like teeing me up here, Stephen. Like for uh, my chapter two is all about expectation management in my book. So I, I think, you know, authentically saying, let's say I'm going to be late. Let's say I was going to be three minutes late. I have a choice. Either I can say, well, it's not that big a deal. They're, they're not that busy. Or they won't mind. Or I maybe pull over. I shoot you a text. I say, hey, I'm going to be five minutes late. My apologies. Like, I think just setting expectations, getting ahead of it, showing the client, the prospect, your teammate that, hey, just because I'm late, I'm not, a, you know, your time is just as important as mine. And I found like when people do that to me, I'm a lot more appreciative, forgiving, understanding versus people that just show up like, you know, not like nothing happened and then let's just move on. Um, seems simple, yet I think those, those small mistakes or small um, habits done um, often really will, will, will erode relationships, at least I've seen in my life. Absolutely. 
and, and maybe not with everyone, but especially with certain types of people who have certain types of mind frames and, you know, everybody works, looks at the world differently. Right. Sure. And it's so important to realize that your way isn't the only way. Correct. You know, it, it's, I think it's really easy to assume that everyone looks, has the same, you know, feelings about time or, you know, especially if you're in field sales and you're meeting 12 people a day, you may have a different relationship with time because you're, you're, you're often running into problems. You know, I hit, I hit a traffic jam. And so you, you're, you almost get a, a, acclimated to certain things that maybe the people that you're meeting with aren't acclimated. They, they hardly leave the office or, or whatever. They have a different perspective on a lot of things. So it's yeah, important I to agree. kind of see that where the, the perspective everybody's coming from. Yeah, I think another example I'd share that regarding expectation management, sometimes in sales, whether it's services or products you're selling, you're going to have bad news to deliver to a client. And we have a choice. Either we pretend that's going to go away. We, uh, we pretend it's not happening or we get ahead of it. And, and you say, Mr. Mrs. Client, I'm really sorry. I just want to set your expectations that the product you bought, I know was supposed to be shipped today. It's not. And I wish I had more control, but here's where we're at. I'm just telling you everything I know. I know it's not the news you wanted, but, or you know, the journey I came from where it was, you know, the staffing consulting world, when we would lose budget, a client would lose budget and we had to lay staff off. I, you know, that was sometimes not fun conversations to go and tell my leaders. Um, and, but I found that when I attacked it head on and realized that, you know, I didn't wake up thinking, man, I can't wait to lose budget and frustrate my leadership team. That, that's my goal today. You know, you kind of give yourself the benefit of the doubt, maybe give yourself a little grace. I found that when we do that, again, it goes back to being authentic. I think you're my, at least in my experience, years of life, my leaders appreciated that more versus just pretending these things weren't going to happen. Absolutely. And do you have, um, I guess, specific or practical examples that can help salespeople who are trying to go from just hearing prospects to being active listeners? Yeah, definitely. I think um, one of the things I've done in the Zoom world, I call it the, the three tap rule is, well, there's two things. I'd say, don't ask two questions in one is one way. And so too often that sellers always ask a couple of questions like, hey, how was your weekend? What'd you do? What's going on? You asked me three questions. But as it relates to listening, ask a question and then tap your finger three times. They're not going to hear it, but it gets me to calm down. And for my notification silent, I'm looking in your eye and telling you whether it's Zoom or on the phone or I mean in person. And I think that the power of listening versus hearing is not just asking one question, ideally what I call TED-based questions that I got taught in my career, but asking a second, third, fourth level question, truly to get to understanding more about the pain problem, the issue that might be at hand. Um, I found that if you just ask a question and start talking about yourself, you, you're the opposite of authenticity. You're doing what every, I would say, non-elite seller does. They just, they come in, you know, can't wait to talk about all the product, the things they got going on in their life, but the client could give, they might give, pardon me, French two shits about it. And if we don't slow down to ask questions that are important to them, because in any, any deal I've ever sold, I think the client's selling themselves. My job is to ask great questions of value, tell stories of success where we've done it in the past and really slow down to go fast. And, and usually by listening, which is a skill you can practice. Right. And, you know, a lot of times when I would, when I would, really focus on the difference between hearing and listening, I take that information I would receive and then send a meeting recap following that meeting or that phone call showing, showing the client or prospect that I truly understood what they said, understood what was important to them. Um, too often, when we're thinking about what other people want to say, the, the key data points go right by us. I, I mean, it happened this morning when I was coaching a client, we were doing a group coaching call and then we did some practice role plays, which I know when I say role plays, salespeople get really tense. Oh no, I don't want to practice. I can't do that. And so many little, I just was throwing little nuggets at them and they were just going right, right by. So um, I, I think the biggest thing is like, the, the, again, ask a question, the three tap rule slows you down, but go deeper in that, in that framework and use open-ended questions to truly understand more about what's important to them. I have not heard that before. The three tap rule. I love that. Especially if you know, you're someone who like is jump, jumps to the next, right? Yeah, they're not going to hear it. Even if you're in person, just put your hand on your leg and tap your leg three times. Because mm -hmm. I think silence is golden in selling. Let your customer, if you're going to ask a great question, let, it, let them think about it. And don't, don't ruin a great question by keep talking. Such an important lesson. Um, and it's a part of listening, I think, that people don't realize. I mean, you, expect, you can't expect people to have a, an answer on hand, especially if it's a, a challenging or a question that makes them think or 
which a lot of great sales questions should. It should make them sit back and say, oh, um, that's a great question. How, how much would that be worth to us to implement a, a solution that could attain that result? Like, huh, and money, that's, I mean, I'd have to calculate that. Yeah, you want them to, you want to ask the questions that cause someone to, you know, have to stop and think. And so you have to wait for the answer. But that is that you said the two words that I, when I teach the people I, I coach, those are the, those are two words I want to hear in any meeting. That tells me I had a great meeting when I hear a great question because I made them think. And that's what great elite sellers do. Um, I always joke, you want to be the Maya Angelou of sales. It's not what you said, why you said it, but how you make people feel when they leave and interaction with you. Are they thinking about you an hour later? Like, man, that guy was different. She was, man, she was prepared. She asked great questions. How'd she know that about my business? And if you're prepared, you know, meaning you showed up on time, which is probably 10 minutes early. You didn't get a ticket on the way because you're freaked out because you're gonna be late. You've actually understood what the company does, what industry they're in. You've looked them up on LinkedIn. You've done the prep. You've, you have a few, you know, four or five discovery questions already ready to go that you've rehearsed. You don't just wing it. Um, and too often, like I, I joke with, I joke with sales teams and sales leaders. I said, imagine if you were on a flight and the pilot sh- sprinted down the jetway just dead sprint and said, man, I'm barely glad I made that. Hey, I usually do a walk around, but it's cold outside. I, I don't want to, I don't want to do. And uh, I, there's a lot of buttons up here. I haven't seen before. They, they, they seem pretty cool. And, you know, I usually do a walk around when I pass that the flight tenants, they might be back there. I'm not sure. We usually file a flight plan, but I'm going to do fun. I don't want to flat a uh, file. And I'm just going to go fast, take off and see where we go. We'll, we'll let you know where we get the cruise, but sit back, relax, have a great flight. Like tell me how, how comfortable you'd be in that example. People like, no, I don't want to be in that flight. I go, then why are you running your business that way? Have a plan, like slow down, listen, understand what you're doing versus just winging it. Absolutely. Well, in general, how can we improve our self-awareness in order to create those relationships and, and, and that are more meaningful and, and deeper with our clients? I think you got to be open to feedback. Um, you know, I, I was, this is an Uncle Rico moment coming from Napoleon Dynamite. I, I played quarterback in college way back in the day. And, you know, I, I had, I had some really, really good games, but I had some games where I was not my best. And when you, and the, the bad part about it is the next day on Sundays, I'd have to go in with my team, watch film of how bad I was. And when you get coached in front of your buddies and you see how bad you are, you can't hide from it. The film never lies. And so I, I usually, I take that same mindset to selling and You know, when I got done with a meeting or I got done with a presentation, I'd always I say, you know, tell me two things you liked and tell me two things I could do differently. Even when we're doing well, seek feedback. So um, you're, you're saying you would seek that feedback from clients in live, in, in live circumstances. Sure. Why not? You know, when I got taught, it was more internally, but I took that advice and went externally with it. And the guy's like, you can't do that. I'm like, why not? I'd, I'd rather know. I always want to know how I'm doing. I don't, I never want to assume. I think I, I know how a client feels about me and we might not like the feedback, And you might not have to agree with them, but we have to be self-aware to know that we all have gaps. No one's perfect. We're far from it. We're all flawed human beings. But, you know, one of my mentors, he said that it's okay not to know every answer. It's just not okay not to do anything about it. So taking that feedback, being self-aware that, hey, I might need to slow down to ask better questions here, or, hey, my follow-up wasn't what it should be, or maybe, God, I haven't been documenting at all. I'm just keeping it in my head and and hoping I'm going to remember when to call these people. So I think, I think sellers, there's this, um, at least my experience being around sales teams, there's a lot of ego. There's a lot of, uh, I have to be perfect. Um, there's a lot of unsaid fear that sales leaders accidentally put in their sales teams because they keep talking. They don't ask enough questions. They all want to be, the, they want to be the smartest in the room without even knowing it. Maybe they get away from, uh, they get away from doing the things that are important, the little things the habits. And all of a sudden you, when, when those things happen, then we get off, off the, off the rails. And so. Um, I don't know. Those are thoughts on my, on my, on my brain when you ask me the question. Makes sense. Well, and, and something you mentioned a couple minutes ago, um, being memorable, you know, I think it's, it's harder and harder these days. It's such an, it's such a noisy world. Uh, it's, it's harder and harder to be memorable. It's harder and harder to get people's attention. Um, what types of advice or thoughts do you have for our listeners about how they can become more memorable uh, with their prospects and, and customers? Yeah, great question. So usually I, I'm, I'm in a, a, a room where you, I normally wouldn't have it blurred out, but in my office at home, I have a belief sign that I would point to right here. 
And it's from my boy, Ted Lasso. And so I think having something like that, that I can point to in my, in behind me, that's like, that makes me memorable. Like one of my clients I was coaching in Europe, he's like, wait, where's, where's the belief sign? Where is it? So I know I'm, a, I'm memorable. I'm memorable to him. Um, I'm, I'm old school with some things. So I, I still like writing handwritten notes. I still like preparing about asking questions that maybe like, why, why would I ask about that when eh, I just, I don't know them well enough. Who cares? Ask. Cause I believe what I do matters. Um, you know, and a story that comes to mind as I'm thinking of this so at the end of my corporate career, I was our executive sponsor over an account and we went in to meet with this executive and two of my sales reps were with me. And I, I Facebook socked a guy. I looked him up on Facebook and I saw that he went to a high school where my high school football coach used to coach at. And I did the math. I'm wait a minute. He was a soft, he left. And then the next year he went and coached me. And so as we're going up in the elevator, I asked him, I said, Hey, I, I said, I see you're a, uh, I see you're a Ram, whatever the, the mascot was. He's like, what? He's like, yeah, I see you're a Ram. He's like, how'd you know that? I said, well, I'm guessing, you know, coach Osborne. He's like, how do you know coach Osborne? I'm like, well, I saw you went, you played high school there, high school football there. And he actually coached me and we're done. Well, you know, a typical meeting that has 30 minutes from his elevator back to his desk. He, he went on to tell me more high school football stories about himself. And I just listened and asked more questions. And I, and thank God my reps didn't say a word. We were there for 40 minutes, 40, 45 minutes. Finally, he goes, oh my God, I am so sorry. I haven't even met you guys yet. What's going on? Casey asked these questions that took me back memory lane and so excited to talk about it. And, you know, what, what can we do for you? I said, why? Well, I'm just here to introduce my team to you. They're, you know, they're the ones on the, on the ground doing the work. I'm here to support them. You know, he's like, well, who do you want to meet? I'll, I'll go make introductions right now. Now, was it luck? Was it fit? I don't know, but it showed I was prepared. It showed that I did some homework. I, I wasn't afraid to ask him a question about his high school football team. Now you're not, and not, that maybe was an easier example because it was just right there in front of me, but the internet is a, a great tool. There's so much information out there. And so I think being memorable is when we ask, I'll go back to something we talked about a second ago, is when you ask really good questions and you make people think you can be very memorable when you, the numerous times you hear, man, great question. Ah, good question. You do that, you'll be memorable all day long. Um, you, and, you, and then when you're prepared to tell stories of success or proof where you've done a solution or a product, you know, good customer interaction uh, previously, you'll be memorable. Um, but I like letting my personality out, you know, again, just leaning in on, I'm going to be myself. And I, I mean, my wife joked me sometimes. She's like, how did you get away with saying that? I think it's tone. You know, I'm, I'm being me. And I, I, you know, I think if I show up and I'm not afraid to joke around a little bit, and maybe I'm respectful. But I think there's a yearning for that where people miss that. I mean, I think another story at the end of my career, I, I met with a guy in a boardroom downtown Dallas, and he was massive ego. I'm not going to say what company, long boardroom. He walked in, he sh shows up like six minutes late, sits down, stares at me. He goes, go and just stares at me. I'm like, so we're going to skip the small talk today. No, no, no present pleasantries go. And in my mind, I'm like, bro, you're not going to get to me. Like you're, Hey, you got dressed, you showered, you brushed your teeth, just like I did today. And I think I had, I, I was that grounded in myself that I'm not going to win every person. I'm not, but I know if I do the, the things like I write about in my book of just habits of how you win people over time, I'm going to win a lot more than the people I'm not going to, I'm not going to, um, I'm, I mean, I'm not going to win everybody, but the goal is when you follow those things, you will. Well, and that's so important, right? I mean, building <clears throat> great relationships, sometimes you stumble across, oh, we had the same football coach or went to the same college or whatever. But the, a, a lot of times, you know, a relationship is built over time. There's trust involved, uh, you know, moving from superficial, you know, we, I, I kind of know who this person is and what their service is to, to something deeper. It does take time. And it, it, how, what strategies, I mean, uh, can you think of that would compress that or what would you do to make sure that over time things are moving in the right direction? I think there's a lot of approaches on that. I mean, you know, some sales teams teach top down, some teach bottom up. Um, I think any relationship that takes time is meant to withstand. If, if it happens too quick, it's probably going to be a little, you reopen the door for maybe some, some rocky roads down, downstream. So as I think about, like when you asked me that question, I think about a, a time in my career where um, I would not go to executives until I had a story to tell, either a story to tell externally or ideally internally. So if I was working with three or four folks under, a, under you know, managers under a VP, I'd go to them with a story. And I think 
over time, when I would say, here's, here's the problems that we found that exist within your company or your industry, here's the problems that we're solving for your specifically under this, these four managers. Um, here's how we're providing a solution. Here's our proof that we're, we're doing it. Here's the outcomes. I'd love to set up time to talk to you about how, how um, just so you know who I am and, and if you have questions, I'd love to bring my executive team so we can align relationships at a certain level. And when I would do it at the right time, I, I found that it definitely opened up more doors. Um, Sometimes as it relates to, to um, relationships taking time, being able to think on my feet and understanding that, okay, wait, this person internally might want to know someone that does the very similar thing in another part of the organization. So it's like understanding your customer, understanding the organization. So being able to think on feet, ask questions to see if he or she might want to go meet with somebody in another, another team. Um, those types of things would shorten relationships. Um, I mean, relationship cycles that might not, that might usually take longer. Um, I, I just think, you know, again, persistence, showing that you care, following up. If you say you're going to follow up on March 3rd, follow up on March 3rd and remind them, hey, I'm Steve, you asked me to give you a call on March 3rd. Today's March 3rd is now a good time. Those old school tactics work, right? Um, I, I, I think about a guy named Orson Sweat Martin, who I wrote about in my book. He, he talked about the power of the gold rule, treating people the way you want to be treated back in the 1700s, 1800s, right? That still is happening now. So I think if I'm treating people the way I want to be treated as it relates to no matter any part of the organization, um, I open my, I'm opening up the door for a lot more opportunities for success than not. Absolutely. And uh, what, what would you say, what mistakes do you see salespeople making that, don't deepen relationships, make things more transactional, and and what could they do to do it differently? Uh, they they talk too much. They don't ask questions. They don't listen. They don't understand the client's business. Um, they're they're not they they pretend to know everything. Um, that's externally. Internally, uh, they don't document because they think my boss has forced me to do it. They don't ask for help. They, they, they complain about being micromanaged because my boss is always on me versus to me, it's a mindset shift. It's a mindset shift. If I say, Hey, Mr. And Mrs. Leader, and hopefully you have a good leader that's has the right mindset too. But if, I found when I would go to my boss and openly share what's in my pipeline, where do I need help? I, I found that my pipeline became a lot more healthier. I had, I had much less fear. Um, and I think sellers, when we, when we're, when we're confident enough to show our gaps, you're going to have so much more success. And sellers who uh, in, in create environments of practice, you're going to have so much more success. Too often, sales teams don't want to practice. They want to wing it. Like I joked about earlier with the pilot example. Why, why wouldn't you want to practice? Major League Baseball take BP. Football players practice every week. But sales, we're that elite. We can just show up and go, which is a joke. I still practice. 46 years old, still practice to this day. Makes, makes total sense. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I remember uh, one sales job I had earlier in my career. I had been there for probably a year and a half selling the same stuff. And they did like a deep training on how to present the presentation that, you know, I'd given a hundred times. And, uh, you know, we had a, a trainer, someone on the team who had watched a ton of people presenting and had written down a bunch of best practices and gave us, watched our presentation, like we presented to him and, and he gave us feedback and, and, uh, and I, I and they, they gave, then they gave kind of like an, an ideal presentation that they had like, you know, honed. I learned so much and it was something I'd done a hundred times. I mean, I'd done more than a hundred times. Who knows how many times I'd done it. <laughs> um, I was doing a hundred times a month. Right. But, um, you know, it, it, I learned so much because, you know, just to take back, step back, practice, someone put a lot of time and thought into what are the best practices here across the board. Um, so you, you can always be better no matter how much you've done something. 100%. I'll tell you one of the best, the best questions I got taught at the end of my career in corporate. Um, that is a mistake. Back to your question about mistakes. So most sellers go in with an agenda. Maybe they do. And they just go right into it. Hey, I'm excited to talk to you today about a, B, and C, and we're here to help you, blah, blah, blah. The question that I got taught that, that changed the game for me that I wish I would have learned in my 20s is that it would be like, you know, hey, thanks for your time today. Before we get started, describe for me what would be an ideal outcome for you in the 40 minutes we have today. And 
when I, when I learned that question, I was like, oh my God, that's awesome. Because it gave you the chance to pivot in case what you have ready to present does not align with what the customer wants to talk about. Even if you already talked three, four days ago and you have an agenda, that was three, four days ago. Maybe something changed. Wouldn't you want to know? And so for me, when I ask that question, I usually hear, ah, great question. Yeah, I'm excited to talk about blah, blah, blah. And you've, you've overcome a lot of adversity in sports and in business. What would you say the biggest lessons um, that you've learned in those experiences that can be applied to field salespeople? Well, the biggest adversity I went through was when I was 17 years old. Um, I still think about it every day. Um, this is an Uncle Rico moment again. I played, uh, so I was a starting quarterback my junior year. I, I, I beat out a kid who was more athletic than me, but I was more cerebral and long story short, went to camps and worked out and did all these things and squeezed every ounce of athletic ability. Um, fast forward to my senior year in high school, that gentleman that I beat out, for, he was now playing tight end. He now had, and uh, we have these things called jamborees in the state of Washington, which are like a practice game for people that don't know what they are. And we had these mini practice games at the, at the fall camp and we're crushing teams, ready to go, having all these success. Well, the last play of the jamboree, I get put back in for whatever reason, serendipity or whatever. And I break my foot in four spots. Two hours later, I'd have surgery. Uh, and all the things I was getting recruited by division one schools, all these things were there. It's now gone. I'm done. I'm like, what? And now the world moves on. And the guy that I beat out my junior year that was going to play tight end, now he has to play quarterback. The team moves on. Now I'm a captain, not acting like it. And I'm feeling sorry for myself. I'm hoping he's going to play bad. I'm hoping he doesn't take away all the glory that I was supposed to get as, a, as an elite quarterback. And he went on to take us to the state playoffs first time in 20 years. He was named second team all-league quarterback. He broke our single season passing yardage record, and I had to just watch. And as it relates to sales, so often we're going to have bad stuff happen to us, but what are you going to do? The world's move on. We are all replaceable. I was a number one rep at K-Force. This company I was at for 10 straight years. Left as the firm's all-time leading sales person, person in company history. Who cares? They're doing great without me. Their, their stock's up. They're doing great. Other people step up. We're all replaceable. Three, after about three games, I went back to my high school football coach and I told him, man, I'm, I'm a mess. I'm borderline depressed. I'm feeling sorry for myself. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a captain. I'm not acting like the way I should. And how I had the emotional intelligence or maturity at a 17-year-old to go ask for help, I don't know to this day. To this day. And my coach, high school football coach, shout out to Marty Osborne and said, man, I'm so proud of you. And I'm like, why are you proud of me? He goes, because you had the, the vulnerability to come ask for help. And I said, this is awesome. There's, you know, well, I got the perfect job for you. You're going to go open the booth and help me call plays. You're my offensive coordinator. I'm like, what? He goes, Jay Cox, you know this offense better than I do. Go up there and call plays with me. Seriously. I'm like, and it was like all that negative energy sucked out. So relating to sales, go ask for help. Don't, you don't need to do it all by yourself, salespeople. You don't need to go be the smartest in the room. I like surrounding myself with my, a team like, they're my offensive linemen. They're my receivers. They're my defense. Like surround yourself with people who are going to help uh, you achieve things. And that requires you to go to your leader and ask for help. It might require you to go to a teammate to ask for help. So um, there's not a day that doesn't go by, Steve, that I don't think about that story of adversity. And it keeps me grounded. Um, it keeps me focused on that I'm only as good as the 1,440 minutes we each get each and every day. And then that clock resets. And I can, I joke with my son actually, who had a, he, he had some adversity in his high school sports career. And I said, I can tell you one thing, bro, the sun gives, could give two shits about you. It's going to come up tomorrow. So as more, as more as we just kind of take a deep breath, realize, Hey, today wasn't the best day. Well, tomorrow we got a chance to get better. No one stays the same. So true. So true. Well, next, next section of the, of the podcast today is called sales in 60 seconds. So quick questions, quick answers. Bye. Um, What's the biggest lesson that you learned while writing your book? Write every single day. Don't there just, you. it doesn't just happen. You got to write. Every, I wrote every day for four months and it came and that's what, that's what helped. Shout out to Bobby Robinson, a former client taught me that advice. That's great advice. Get a lot done doing something every day. Just a little bit, a few, few yards downfield, right? Yeah. What, uh, what in your opinion is the golden rule for business? Treat people the way you want to be treated. We, we back. That, yeah, five oh. years old is important, but now we get adults. We don't have to, we can be assholes to each other. Why is that? Why is that? Okay. Who was the person's name you mentioned a few minutes ago? It oh. goes back to the 1700s. Oh, yeah, it's actually 1800s. Orison Sweat Martin. 
Morrison Sweat Martin. M A R D E N. Great. Re look him up. Beast. <laughs> Love it. Um, and how can salespeople shift from like a from negative thinking towards practical optimism? Uh, I have a daily four minute meditation I do to help with that because sales is about mindset. It's called the ha, which is, um, so the first minute I do breathing second minute, I do, I have statements, physical, emotional, opportunistic. I have an opportunity to do X. I have an opportunity to be a great leader. Third minute is I am statements, physical, emotional, opportunistic. And last minute I will, will be, I will statements. And I find when I do that, I get in the right mindset. Um, if I have a bad, if I'm having a bad, let's say I get in an argument with my son or my daughter or my wife or whoever it may be, don't go into the office with that negative energy. It's not your team's fault. Take a deep breath, clear your mind, go in with the right attitude. Enter the huddle as a quarterback, enter the right, enter the huddle as a pilot. Enter, don't enter the cockpit with negative energy. Not their Wait, fault. Well, and, and on that point, you're, you're kind of bridging a lot of stuff from the home to professional, you know, your podcast and everything, you, you know. How can you talk a little about how salespeople can apply what they know, what their you know, their skills, their leadership skills in the home? That's kind of a an area of expertise for you, I'd say. I think it's again, it's it goes back to ask for help. It goes back to don't bring negative energy home. If you have a bad day, it's not your kid's fault. It's not your wife's fault. If you got to take two minutes before you enter the door, take a deep breath. I had friends that played in the NFL, and, and they their kids could give two, you know what, their dad threw two interceptions against the Bengals against lines, who cares? So I think when we, and then listening, like I learned this thing from a friend named Matt Miller. He, he taught me to say, how, how many men out there say, hey, honey, tell me how I can be a better husband this week. Hey, hey, bud, hey, son or daughter, tell me how I can be a better dad this week. Ask good open-ended questions to get better conversations. Yeah, I, I feel like that's that's a lesson you can take almost anywhere in life, right? Any kind of relationship and, you know, as asking just directly asking how how can we make this better how can we how could i improve how could we improve how can i change this to make it better what's what are your what are your challenges with this right now having that kind of open conversation with people can often lead to better results win-win situations it goes back to self-awareness yeah well as an actionable takeaway what should the field sales people who are listening today do as a first step towards building more authentic relationships with their prospects and customers. So I got, I learned this from my, my friend named John Kaplan. He, he, he taught me this phrase called seller deficit disorder, which, which is two symptoms. He said, they don't listen and they don't understand my business. That's, that's two reasons why clients do not like salespeople. So if you're a younger seller, go research the, pro, the, the industry you're serving, understand the problems that exist for your, your and then listen. Don't go into the meeting knowing you have to be the perfect rep. Don't go into the meeting knowing you have to have the perfect pitch down. I always teach people, if you go on asking great questions because you're prepared, you understand their industry, you understand what's going on. And then knowing, just real, and then give yourself grace that it's going to take time. You're not going to go in and meet someone the first time they're going to give you a $40 million order. It's not going to happen. Unless you're going to create the next post-it note that we don't know about. You know, I think for people who are just starting out in sales, Focus on the fundamentals, the basics. There's so many companies I'm working with right now that after I get done working with them, they'll be like, I can't believe we weren't doing that. It was so obvious right in front of us. And we got, we got complacent. We got going too fast and we got to slow down. Well, I'm going to try to summarize everything that you've taught our, our learners here for uh, in about you know, two minutes or so. So first of all, Casey believes that vulnerability is not a weakness, but actually a strength. Being authentic in sales helps your customers feel that you're truly in it for them. Set expectations and get ahead of anything that pops up so that you can strengthen your relationships with consistency. Practice active listening by intentionally slowing down and ask follow-up questions to get to the core of a problem. The salespeople need to be open to feedback. Ask prospects two things they like and two things that could, that could be improved about your service, about your, your presentation, about, about uh, the, the product, the company, the relationship, anything. Build your memorability with a personalized approach, like handwritten notes, preparing in advance to connect with prospects, um, and, and asking great questions. 
It takes time to build relationships. You've got to be persistent. You've got to follow up when you say you will. And, and you've got to listen. Ask this question at the start of your sales meetings to understand your prospects' goals. Describe for me what an ideal outcome would be for you with our 40 minutes that we're going to spend together today. And that way you can pivot your conversation um, in, to their needs. I just, I, I, I love that. I love that. And it's probably something that a lot of us aren't doing and a lot of us could implement. Finally, don't be afraid to ask for help. Be vulnerable. Reach out to your manager, your mentor, your teammates, your wife or husband, your kids, if you ever get stuck. Be vulnerable. Well, this has been fantastic, Casey. Where can our listeners read more about your work, hear more from you? How, how, what's the best way to get in touch with you? Well, before I do that, I, I got to give like much love, brother. That was like an amazing recap. <laughs> you killed it. <laughs> this is what I do. <laughs> that is very well done. You are a good listener. Thank you. Um, the best play, well, so my book's on Amazon. Um, it's on Kindle. It's on paperback. It's also on Audible. I actually narrated the book myself. Uh, which was an awesome process to go through. I actually learned something every time I read the book uh, and I'm the author, which tells me that these, these common sense principles are there for life. We all need to keep focusing on them. Um, LinkedIn is a great place to find me as well. So if you want to, if something intrigued you about this conversation, please reach out, connect with me on LinkedIn and, or you can visit my website, which is just kcjcox.com. Talks about the, all the things I'm up to regarding to my, my podcast, coaching, um, speaking, et cetera. Fantastic. Well, this has been uh, another great episode of the Outside Sales Talk. If anyone can think of any other sales reps that would benefit from, from the, the wisdom that Casey's dropped on us today, definitely share the love and forward this podcast forward. Um, and uh, you know, Casey, I really appreciate you coming today. This has been great. I'm honored to have to the opportunity to join you guys, and I really appreciate it. And I hope that people got something out of it today. Thanks, and, and, and uh, everybody take care until next time.